Hi everyone, so today we'll be reviewing the scientific studies which have been done looking at anti-bark spray collars and comparing them to anti-bark shock collars. Now a spray collar is an e-collar which is activated by the sound of a dog barking and when activated they release a spray either of plain or scented water and they work by interrupting and punishing the barking which aims to reduce the likelihood of the barking happening in the future basically by making it an unpleasant thing to do. So the first study was done by Wells in 2001 and it was an in-home study using 30 dogs who barked at the TV, traffic or while in the car. So 15 of the dogs wore the collar for 30 minutes every day and 15 wore them for 30 minutes every other day in the presence of the stimulus which normally elicited barking and the owners were then asked to rate the frequency of their dogs barking during that 30 minutes. So if we look at the data, this is the average score owners gave between 5 barked very frequently and 1 barked very infrequently. Before the collar was used, the first week it was used and so on and then in the week following the three-week trial when the dogs didn't wear the spray collars. And as you can see, the spray collars did significantly reduce the amount that the dogs barked. However, as the trial continued, the barking began to increase again. And although it didn't reach the level it was at before the collars were used, the upward trend suggests it would eventually become ineffective. And the authors suggested this was because the dogs had habituated to the collars. So basically, they got used to them, so they became less aversive and so less effective as a punishment. And what's interesting is intermittent use of the collar, so every other day, was more effective than everyday use and led to much less habituation. And dogs who wore the collar continuously had a much sharper increase in barking when the collar was removed, possibly because the dogs who wore the collar continuously learned more quickly that the collar was the cause of the sprays. But obviously you have to remember with studies like this that an owner rating is not always the most reliable measure of something. So if we move on to a study which compared the effectiveness of shock and spray collars, each dog in this study wore one type of collar for two weeks, then no collar for a week, and then the second type of collar for two weeks. And the owners then rated their dogs on a scale of one, much greater than before the trial, to five, much less than before the trial for the frequency, loudness and duration of their dog's barking. So if we look at the results, 77.8% of dogs wearing spray collars had a reduced frequency, duration and volume of barking compared to only a 25% of dogs wearing the shock collars. And one issue some of the owners highlighted was that the collars would often activate in response to other sounds, which may have made them less effective by making the punishment inconsistent. So next, a study that looked both at effectiveness of shock and spray colours and their impact on stress levels. So 24 dogs in a rescue kennel were selected and they were selected because they would bark at another dog when they saw one. So they split these dogs into three groups. The first wore bark activated shock collars, the second bark activated spray collars and the third wore no anti-bark collar. The dogs wore the collars switched off for half an hour every day for a week and then for a fortnight they wore the collars for 30 minutes on three days a week whilst another dog was walked in front of their kennel and the duration of the dog's barking was recorded and following this their cortisol levels were taken. So the authors of the paper report that the dogs wearing the anti-bark collars barked less by the second day of use than the dogs without wearing them and that there was no difference in the amount of barking between dogs wearing shock and spray collars. However, if we actually look at the data that was collected, the dogs with anti-bark collars did bark less on the second day only on the second day. On the third day, all three groups barked exactly the same amount. So the bark collars were not reducing the amount the dogs barked. So if we move on to the cortisol levels, remembering that cortisol is a hormone animals release when stressed, the dogs in the anti-bark collar group had an increased cortisol level of 169%. But this did not reach statistical significance and so it was concluded that the collars did not cause stress. Now, if you've seen my video on shock collars, you'll see this finding contradicts the findings of several other studies. And there were two methodology issues in this study which may be the cause of this discrepancy. So firstly, the study lacked a proper control. 
Cortisol levels reach a summation under stress, basically a point at which they can go no higher. And it's possible that in dogs which are reactive to other dogs, they reach this level purely by exposure to another dog. And so any stress caused by the collars can't be detected by cortisol levels because they can't go any higher. The control, which was supposed to provide a baseline cortisol measurement for comparison, was done by taking the dog out of its kennel to the vets to have blood drawn, but when the collars were worn, the dog's blood was taken in the kennels, and obviously being taken to the vet's office would cause stress that was not present in the subsequent weeks, making a comparison between these two irrelevant. And the final issue was, the three groups were not equal in the amount they barked before the experiment took place. So any differences observed between the three groups couldn't necessarily be attributed to the collars. So as I was reading this study, I was trying to figure out why the researchers had used such odd stats and made their methods so difficult to analyse, and why they had reported the collars successful based on the second day and ignored the lack of improvement on any other day. And when I looked at the bottom of the paper in the acknowledgement section, I discovered that the whole study was bought and paid for by Radio Systems Corporations, otherwise known as PetSafe a major maker and seller of shock and spray collars. And I just wanted to use this as an opportunity to highlight the issue with accepting evidence or facts that other people have provided. Even researchers themselves in study summaries and in conclusions often stretch the truth. So it's always a good idea to check out the source yourself if you can. And obviously not everyone has a scientific background and not everyone is able to access or understand scientific literature, but the names of all the studies I've used as they always are are listed below in the description if you do want to read them. So finally we're going to look at alternatives to the use of an anti-bark collar using a paper which discusses the pros and cons of several different methods to stop excessive barking using case studies to compare their effectiveness. So to start with anti-bark collars. The author reported that these were very effective in a lot of cases, but can become less effective over time, and in some cases, although not very many, dogs barking escalated rather than decreased, particularly with shock collars, and the author noted that if this caused continual activation of the collars, it could sometimes lead to burns. And the author highlighted that the issue with punishment techniques like spray collars is that they suppress the behaviour, they stop the barking, but they don't deal with the underlying motivation. So basically dogs bark for a reason, which could be stress, fear, frustration, excitement, and the punishment doesn't help the dog to feel any more confident and relaxed. It just reduces the barking itself. So the author also offers and discusses the effectiveness of three other techniques. Desensitisation counter conditioning and putting the behavior on cue. So firstly, desensitization. This is where you expose the dog to the bark eliciting stimulus at a level just below the point they start barking and reward that quiet behavior. And then you up the proximity and the intensity of the stimulus a little bit at a time and reward the dog for being quiet at each step. Counter conditioning is to teach and reinforce an incompatible behavior and then request it when the barking is likely to occur and reward the dog for complying. So for example, To have the dog bring or hold something, to sit and watch the owner, or even to have the dog play a game of fetch, a game of tug, or to give them a food toy at times when they would usually bark. Basically anything that gives them a rewarding alternative to barking. And finally, putting the behaviour on cue, i.e. teaching the dog a speak and quiet command and then using these in the presence of whatever makes the dog bark. And the author found that these alternative methods were very effective, but did require more time and effort on the part of the owner. However, they have the added benefit of not just teaching the dog not to bark, but teaching them not to be scared or frustrated or whatever internal negative state is making them bark, as they link the bark eliciting stimulus with something pleasant like a game or with treats. And so by removing the dog's motivation to bark, they offer a permanent solution while at the same time improving the dog's welfare. Now, those are all the current studies that have been done on anti-bark collars, and much more study is going to be needed before a conclusion about anti-bark collars can be reached. A major issue with all the studies we've looked at is they either didn't consider stress or the effect on the dog's general behaviour, or they only looked at it in the short term, and there were no 
experimental studies to give a true comparison of the different methods. But what we can do is look at the general effects of punishment and e collar use to give us a general idea of these things, and I have separate videos which look at the evidence around those topics. But to summarise, anti-bark collars can work to reduce certain forms of barking, however they seem to only work for a certain length of time as the dog becomes used to them. And finally, when anti-bark collars are compared, spray collars are just as, if not more effective, than shock collars. So, like this video if you liked it, or dislike it if you disliked it, but if you did, please take the time to comment and explain why. Was it confusing? Did it not answer a question you had? Or maybe it challenges a prior belief of yours, and you have some alternative evidence to the studies I found? If so, tell me, and let's have a discussion about it, because that is what science is all about, considering multiple ideas, and then seeing which is supported by the evidence.